What is up, people? Welcome back. In this video, I'll teach you everything you need to know about money, except uh, how to make it and what to do with it once you have it. Okay, so I'm teaching you what you need to know for this class about money. Just play the music. And don't forget to smash that like button and to subscribe while the music plays. Well, so let's start by defining money. Money is any asset that is accepted as a means of payment. As mentioned in the 4.1 video, currency in circulation, or as we humans call it, cash, and bank deposits are both considered money. Demand deposits are money because we can spend what's in our checking account. For now, we're going to focus on three functions of money. It serves as a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of value. Let's explore each of these. Before we do, though, I want to make a dramatic claim that I'm sure will be misunderstood but here it goes anyway. Money is awesome. Like, one of the greatest inventions of all time level awesome. Now, before you accuse me of being greedy or materialistic or ignoring inequality, that's not at all what I'm talking about. The biggest thing that money does is that it facilitates trade and exchange. In a world without money, you'd have a barter system. And it's much more difficult to trade in that world because you'd become reliant on a coincidence of wants. How does a math teacher get a loaf of bread if the baker doesn't want a math lesson from her? Money steps in and fills this role by acting as a medium of exchange, since people are willing to provide their goods and services to you in exchange for money, because they know that they can use that same money to exchange for something that they want. And money serves as a unit of account, allowing us to easily compare the relative value of goods, services, and labor. For example, without money, it would be very difficult to determine the relative value of a math lesson and two loaves of bread, or an iPhone. But money makes it easy. We just look at the prices. Third, money functions as a store of value, meaning that it maintains its value over time, though inflation limits the effectiveness of this role. On a multiple choice question about the functions of money, if the example has to do with saving or considering money over time, the answer is most likely store of value. Okay, so we've established the functions of money. Now let's consider the three primary types of money. Commodity money, commodity-backed money, and fiat money. Commodity money is sort of the OG money. It's something that has intrinsic value aside from being money, meaning that if people stopped accepting it as a medium of exchange, it would still have other value. Gold and silver, or more dramatically, even cigarettes and prisons, are all examples of this since they have utility outside of being accepted as a medium of exchange. Commodity-backed money is what happens when commodity money levels up, and is usually a paper form of money that represents a certain amount of a commodity like gold or silver. Now instead of actually having to bring gold to buy something, you can buy stuff with a piece of paper that says it can be redeemed for a specific amount of gold or whatever commodity it represents. This is obviously a lot more convenient, and again facilitates trade since the money is more portable and people have confidence in it because they know that they can trade it for the commodity if they ever want to. Today, the US and virtually every other developed country has fiat money, which basically means that the US dollar is money because the US government says that it's money. There's no commodity backing it up. We accept it as money because we believe other people will also accept it as money. Well, and because you need it to pay your taxes but it's not backed up by anything more than the full faith and credit of the US government. So yeah, it's not wrong to say that we have faith-based money. Okay, now let's finish up with more specific definitions of money. We defined money earlier as anything that can be used as a means of payment, but there are actually several versions of what exactly constitute money. First, the term money supply refers to the total value of financial assets in the economy that are considered money but there are different ways we can measure it depending on which financial assets we choose to include or to exclude. The M1 definition of the money supply includes three things, currency in circulation or cash, demand deposits, and savings deposits. M1 is a narrow definition of money that only includes the most liquid financial assets. The M2 definition is broader. It includes all of M1, as well as time deposits and money market funds. These are considered near monies, meaning that they aren't money because you can't spend any of them, but they are relatively liquid and can quickly be converted into currency or demand deposits. 
Lastly, there's the monetary base, which is often labeled M0, and equals currency in circulation plus bank reserves. And well, there's another term we haven't defined yet, so bank reserves refer to money banks have, but haven't lent out. We'll talk more soon about the significance of the monetary base, but for now, enjoy this nice Venn diagram that shows the overlap between the money supply and the monetary base. They both include currency, whereas the money supply includes demand deposits and the monetary base includes bank reserves. I promise all of this will pay off in the next couple of videos. All right, well, that's it for this one. Until next time, this has been a La Money production. Thanks again for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, and to ring the bell, and check out the description for a link to the answers to the practice questions up on the screen right now, as well as the unit notes and a great review book that I've written for you. And I will see you in the next video.